Hey, Steve. Thanks so much for joining me. George, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so when we talk about uh, impact and ESG, um, environmental, social governance, um, you know, I've been seeing more and more companies lean into it. You know, I, I'd say over the past several years, I, I see a lot of strategy decks help with a lot. It's, it's, it's taking up larger portions of those strategies uh, for corporations. But at the same time, I feel like there's some skepticism as well. And I thought maybe that would be an interesting place to start. You know, I feel like some people can be like, oh, it's some social impact sponsored by Blackwater, you know, or sustainability sponsored by Halliburton, you know, and, and I, I, while I know that's not always the truth, uh, I, I wonder if you could shed a little light on the true impact that's out there with the ESG investments. Yeah, George, that's such a really interesting place to start. And let's start the skepticism from the business point of view. Um, uh, because I think a lot of that skepticism is, is this just another mandate? Is this a version of tax or regulation by another name? And it's interesting because, you know, I can't say I'm unsympathetic to the way that some of those companies might think. And so in my career, one of the things that I've been focusing on is trying to measure and see if there is a real financial business case for doing this. And so a few years ago, um, some companies that I was working with, uh, Verizon and Campbell's Soup, you know, which is kind of an odd pairing, you know, two great tastes <laughs> that taste great together, I guess, came and approached um, uh, our team and said, look, can you put to bed whether or not Focusing on environment, social, and governance, or ESG, is good for the bottom line or bad for the bottom line, or we will never know. And so mm -hmm. we did a massive study. It was sort of a form of a meta type of analysis. It's actually called a, syst a systemic analysis. And it looked at, at this point, over 600 studies, very rigorous studies, most of them academic studies. And what we found is, is a number of really interesting conclusions. Um, I'll share a couple with you to start and we can sort of dive in. That'd be great. One is, is that yes, indeed, ESG does pay dividends for the financial bottom line and for top line, but only, only if you do it well. And you think that this is like captain obvious. It's like, wow, oh, you do something well and you get benefits out of it. Well, the interesting thing about ESG is, is that, you know, there's a lot of politics around this and there's a lot of hope that pretty much anything that you do in ESG is going to drive good financial returns. That could not possibly be true. Um, it's not true of any part of the business. You have to do every aspect from marketing, from R and D, from sales, from production, manufacturing. If you don't do it well, you lose money, right? Mm -hmm. Same with ESG. Um, the, the real finding, and I think the, the, one of the credibility points of our research is saying that, yeah, you can lose money if you do ESG poorly, but here's the thing. You do it well, just like any other part of the business, it actually will drive financial success. And the financial success that we found can be expressed in sort of ranges. Um, so if you look at key performance indicators for the business, we find that companies that do ESG well outperform their peers in stock market price performance and share price performance by anywhere from one to 6%. They can actually boost their revenue from sales by anywhere from one to 20%. They can reduce their employee turnover by anywhere from one to 50%. They can boost employee productivity by about 13% and they can increase their market cap valuation by as much as around 11%. There's, there's more indicators that I could share uh, related to financial risk and other risks. But that gives you a flavor of the kind of potential that ESG has to support the business. Um, but I'll stop there and, and, and see what that leads. Uh, well, it's great news. I kind of want to like scream it from the rooftops, right? Because it, you know, you're showing with hard data that you know, doing, doing good in the world actually does well for your, your bottom line, which is, is wonderful. Um, you know, one thing that it's funny that this reminds me of is um, some younger folks might not remember the days, but we used to have to do ROI analysis for why you would invest in user experience. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd have to analyze how many clicks something would take and if it would help turnover, like you just said, or if it would help retention and, and conversion. And um, now it's just kind of a given that user experience, you need to do it well. And it's funny, in those early days, people would also say, well, we want a user experience just like Apple. But they didn't realize to fully go in and do that how much of an investment that they needed to, to make on it. Um, I hope this doesn't hurt your feelings, but I kind of hope like 
that work that you're doing, that ROI work, is, is like you're out of business in a decade so that people just, they know that they have to do it. It's table stakes, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. And in fact, in the ESG field, you have no idea how much that exact conversation comes up. And the analogy that we always use is total quality management. You know, it's like, hmm. um, you know, in the, in the, from the 1960s and before, if you wanted to focus on quality, you had a quality team. And what that guaranteed was that your products and your manufacturing processes were probably going to have a lot of defects, right? Quality was probably not going to be embedded into what you would, would produce. And it wasn't until quality became those kinds of table stakes as you talk about that it became embedded in the way that every manager and executive thinks and into their key performance objectives um, that actually quality started to mean something and you actually started to get better, longer lasting, safer products. We really need to head the same direction with ESG. What I would say is, is that there are a lot of companies um, in certain industries that are that are probably trying to declare victory a little bit too soon on that. We've got a long way to go, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, one poking into that a little bit, so in preparation for this conversation, I've been weaving this into my, my conversations with executives. And one theme that I found is there's a lot of companies out there where they're doing a t they are doing a ton of real work uh, of, on, from ESG and impact and and um, but what they say is we don't really want to brag about it because we feel that if we brag about it, we're going to open ourselves up to maybe some um, criticism of the things that we do that we know aren't great for the environment, you know, because they create products that they might have plastic in it what, when they're trying to offset that. And they're like, we just kind of want to, especially private companies, right? We're like, we just want to do this work. We don't necessarily want to brag about it. And I'm curious in your impact analysis, how much of that bottom line impact is from like just doing it versus also then talking about it so that people know that you're doing it. Yeah. So this has been a perennial problem and it's almost at, you know, the level of sort of a grand philosophical question. We all know that, you know, famous query of if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to <laughs> see it doesn't make any noise. And in the answer of the ESG realm, our research finds definitively that the tree does not make a noise if no one's there to see it. So mm -hmm. we have to communicate. Um, awareness is key. If there's no awareness, all the results I just talked about, the 6% share price boost, the, the revenue boost to 20%, I'm not going to say that it entirely goes away, but a lot of it goes away. What we need to do is we need to have our stakeholders understand. So what that leads to is a lot of really, really bad advertising and communications and PR around ESG. Mm -hmm. And I can give you two types of examples of bad efforts to communicate, um, which get to the problem that you were talking about, George. Um, uh, so the first one is, um, if you can imagine, if you were going to shop for a high-performance tire for you know your, your fancy sports car, if one has it. Um, Talk my language. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, and you go in and you see an advertisement for a high-performance tire that says, Buy our high-performance tire made from over 60% post-recycled materials, right? Mm -hmm. What would your reaction be? Well, actually, a tire maker studied that. And what they found was is that the, the consumer's reaction was, oh, my God, I can see what's going to happen if I use that tire. This post-recycled content material sounds completely unsafe, low performance. I'm going to be doing a tight curve at X number of miles an hour, and it's going to blow out, and I'm going to die. Um, so when you start saying, buy our product, it's green, the consumer hears, well, if you're focusing on being green, that must mean that it's bad. That must mean it doesn't taste very good, right? It doesn't it's a paper perform. straw, right? It's going to yeah. turn to mush in your mouth. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's really bad communications. The other communication that, um, is really, really bad is bragging, um, and boasting and saying, Hey, we're the greenest, we're the best. We're the most responsible, um, so buy from us. This space, you have to walk a really fine line. You've got to be humble. Um, mm -hmm. So the kind of communication that works is sort of doing the reverse of both of those things. It's saying, look, we have a tire that is higher performing, and it is performing in part because we've innovated the use of recycled materials, which makes the tire safer, stronger, and better, Right. And by the way, it's also green. Um, so you should buy it. 
that works wonders. It's like, wow, this is really interesting. Sounds innovative and green. I love it, right? That's the reaction that you find. The other thing you have to do, um, and that gets to your point about saying, look, the company is worried that saying, hey, unless we're perfect on every dimension, we don't want to talk about it. If you go out and you say, look, we've prioritized something that we know our stakeholders, our customers, our employees care about, our investors care about, and we're trying to do the best we can, and we're trying to work with people, and we're trying to make progress. We know we're not perfect, but, but we're trying to make progress. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And when you say that message, people are more forgiving and more embracing, and they're saying, you know what, I trust that company, um, as opposed to the company that says, hey, we're great. You know, we do our, our, our waste, we're green, we're better. People get skeptical, they want to tear those companies down. So balancing that communication is key. It's so funny how, you know, you can't seem to get away from authenticity and bravery being recipe for success really in, in any topic that you cover. And, um, and when I think about that bravery as a company, there's probably got to be an executive at the table when, when you're doing strategy planning that does have to be that brave one to say, hey, I saw some numbers on this. I think I can improve our bottom line and do some good in the world. You know, how about we do this? And, and you said you kind of have to go all in. Um, I'm curious what have you seen as far as how much better do the organizations that go all in perform versus ones that are kind of half in versus ones that just say, we're not going to bother? Well, we did some research. So we've come up through our research. When we talk about doing ESG well, we've come up with a framework that we call FIT, Commit, Manage, and Connect. Um, FIT is really about integration into strategy. Commit is really about the focus and putting resources to those, those strategic focus areas. Manage is managing this with the same discipline you use for any other part of the business. And then Connect is actually reaching out and connecting what you're doing on ESG to your investors, your customers, your employees, but also some non-traditional stakeholders, your communities, some of the NGOs, the activists sort of engaging with them, right? And so when you do that, we've done some research uh, that we've not published um, because we didn't want to publish it because we're trying to take advantage of it, um, that <laughs> looked at a five-year period, 16 different industries, reviewed 600 companies, and identified how companies that we rate um, as doing well in that fit, commit, manage, and connect framework, do versus the rest. We eliminated in our metrics any examination of their financial performance. So we didn't look at that, whether they'd done good, bad, or indifferent. The companies who adopt our good practice framework that we call the Project ROI good practice framework um, outperformed the S&P by 117% over that five-year period. And in all 16 industries, every single industry, the good practice companies on ESG, Project ROI Framework, um, outperformed um, the standard um, in their industry segment. Um, so that's, that's the benefit you can do. There's also sort of a fun counterintuitive lesson that we learned. And that is that if you could imagine um, investing your retirement savings in one of three different types of companies, an absolute leader in ESG, an absolute Neanderthal, laggard, skeptic, does not believe in ESG, will never believe in it. Or a company that's in the middle, trying to go along to get along, do a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, report some things, whatever, some programs. You would retire and go off to whatever tropical island you want to go to if you invest in the ESG leader. That's the best performer. Second mm -hmm. best performer is the Neanderthal, is a laggard. And the third is the one that's going along to get along. So the lesson there is that you really do have to go all in. You have to go big or go home. Um, and if you're just in the middle, what happens is you're getting punished by both sides. Your old school investors think, why are you doing this stuff? You're distracting from the company. We don't get it. Um, and then your employees, your customers, and communities are thinking, you don't really care about this. You're not really a good corporate citizen. We can't trust you. Um, mm. And so you're losing on both sides. Yeah, it's kind of obvious when you're in your heart's not in it, right? Really, yeah. in anything in life. Um, and it's curious that you use the example of putting your retirement funds in there because um, I've seen glimmers, and I'm curious since you're closer to it, how much of this is happening. But kind of transparency in investing, where you're seeing people's investment directions, you know, they want to allocate it towards companies that are rating better in, in ESG initiatives or VCs or PEs that are actually setting aside impact funds. And uh, I'm curious if what you're seeing in that landscape as far as where the money's going. 
There's some incredible statistics. I don't have a command over them, but if there's a chance to follow up, I'll, um, I'll follow up. I'm not remembering them right now, but um, some amazing forecasts that by as soon as 2025, that the amount of assets related, uh, assets under management and the investment that go into funds that are screened somehow for ESG, we're going to start to get into real, real numbers. We're talking like, you know, starting to approach like one third um, uh, of all assets under management, which is, you know, ginormous um, uh, when you think about um, uh, the, the size of the investment industry right now. So this field is just absolutely on rocket fuel. Um, and what's happening is, is that, yeah, it's, it's generational that millennials and the zillennials um, care about this and that they want to see this going in. That doesn't mean that the Xers and the boomers don't care about this either. Um, they're, they're, they've sort of set the trend. Um, and so the other thing that's going into this is that we're finding that there's more of an investment uh, hypothesis that actually COVID, interestingly, affected. There's this sort of repeated story among some of the big investment houses where there was this moment where you had these ESG teams in these investment houses who were starting to, you know, scratch and claw and make a little bit of headway. And then the pandemic hit and the executives in these sort of famous investment houses all came and said, why did we not anticipate this? And we're getting mm. you know, crushed um, in the early months of lockdown. And the ESG team members kind of raised their hand and said, you know what, if you had paid attention to our metrics, we would have been with more stable, safer companies um, that were more strategically attuned and able to respond to this and pivot. Um, and pretty much there was this uniform unanimity um, among, among the CEOs of these different houses that said, okay, you're on, you're front and center. Um, uh, we want ESG involved in all of our uh, investment theses now. Um, <laughs> and so... That over the last 18 months has been a sea change um, in terms of the prominence of ESG, both in the investment world, but also driving corporate behavior, as you can imagine, that you know, C-suites are, are waking up to ESG really quickly now. Yeah, you'd think that, that an organization that's really strong on ESG would have more diversity in their supply chain, right? And they'd be more resilient for, for things like this. That, that makes a lot of sense. Funny timing, just yesterday an article came across my feed that um, the prediction is that the next thousand unicorn companies, so you know, with exits of a billion plus, are, are going to be—they're all going to be green com companies. You know, whether it be you know decarbon or supply chain uh, sustainability or, or you name it, it's all in that world. So there, it does seem like there's dump trucks of investments that are just pulling up and, and dumping off cash into this whole space. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating, and, and I'm not surprised. Um, and I think about one of my major clients, which is a um, $20 billion company, and they've got a really interesting inorganic growth strategy coming up, and they've decided that our next um, multi-billion dollar business is going to be in companies that are sort of uh, in the sustainability arena and solving problems, environmental and social problems. Um, and so they're sort of putting you know their chips into the table on this, on these types of, of unicorns. And you think about it, um, and the, the analysis actually is pretty clear that we're, we're in such a moment right now where the major challenges of the world, you know, uh, climate change being the obvious one, um, the amount of costs that this is going to create and the amount of opportunity that can come both in terms of supporting some of the mitigation efforts um, and trying to decarbonize our economy and the atmosphere is huge. You know, we can look at Tesla um, as one of the poster children of that, right? Um, mm. But we also have huge opportunities in terms of how we're going to have to start adjusting our life to a world that is uh, more affected by climate change and, and how we stay safe in that life across all different types of, of products and concerns. So really, I, I would I would say that those unicorns, those those thousand unicorns, as you were talking about, um, uh, that's a pretty safe bet, I think, to say that that they're going to have some kind of sustainability feature in what they do. It's exciting, um, but for the larger, more established organizations, even if you've got uh, several executives that really want to push into this, it could be tough. It could be tough to, sh to make any changes or shift. And I'm, I'm curious what you're hearing or seeing on the street, both with your research and, and your interviews. You know, what are, what are these executives saying? 
Yeah, so we just did um, a, in partnership um, with the United Nations Foundation, um, a fascinating piece of research. So we did interviews, confidential anonymous interviews with 21 leading famous brands from fashion, food, and technology. And we wanted to focus on their efforts to build um, responsible and sustainable supply chain management because that is one of the keys. A huge proportion, for example, of greenhouse gas emissions comes from a company's supply chain. A huge amount of their concerns in terms of their community impacts about whether or not um, their, their extended operations are making communities worse off, creating poverty, creating human rights violations, bad working conditions are coming from their supply chain. And so there's huge pressure on companies, and, and I'm not going to name them, but I'm not saying that they were part of our interview, but you look at a Walmart, for example, gigantic pressure on Walmart to make sure that they're accountable for the behavior, the responsible environmental and social behavior of their suppliers, right? So we spent some time talking to executives and said, you are doing so much to try and keep your suppliers accountable uh, uh, on these dimensions. And you're really investing a lot. Do you think it's working? And the answer was a little nuanced. They said, look, we're proud of the effort we're making, but if we wanna be honest, no, it's not having an impact. Um, programs work, but the entire approach doesn't workers are not safer because of what we're doing. Communities are not better off because of what we're doing. The environment's not better off because of what we're doing. Theater. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more than theater, but it's like, it's doing just enough. Um, it's doing real stuff plus uh, doing that real stuff to, to make sure that you can sort of put what you need to put in reports. Mm. So that's where the theater comes in. Right. And so that, that was eye-opening to hear. And so then we asked, okay, so what do we do? How do we get to the, the, the next step so the impact is real? And the first thing out of their mouths, and this is something that we heard from not um, unanimous, but the vast majority said, one of the things that we need is we need pressure on us. We need those activists. In the 1990s, we were always seeing activist campaigns of major environmental groups like Greenpeace, um, like Oxfam coming after companies and naming and shaming them, doing all kinds of creative protests. They were saying, we need that back um, because that's sort of been lost over the last decade. Um, And for a number of reasons we can talk about, but saying we need that pressure. In fact, it would be great if they don't just pressure our brand, but actually attack our CEO directly by name. Wow. Um, Which is like, (laughs) This is like, you know, you know, a, a real person bites dog story, you know, it's just completely <laughs> mind bending. Um, and so they were saying, we want, we want that pressure back. And if we get that pressure, that will give us the space with our investors and with our executives to ratchet up and go to the next level of commitment and investment. That's not all they need. They need that stronger business case that I was mentioning from our project ROI research, um, particularly focused on, on share price revenue and cost control. Um, and they also need much better partnerships um, uh, that um, have better technical support and assistance. All that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, it's, it's, it's that mix of really, really big, hard uh, sticks along with enticing carrots um, uh, that we need to, to make that next phase improvement. If that makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. They want that accountability, but I guess when your job is to maximize shareholder value, you kind of get a, get all the shareholders on board and that there's enough noise out there that's being focused at your, your company, that it kind of becomes something that you, you can't not do right at, at that point. Interesting that CEO directly. I wonder if those people were just maybe a little annoyed with their CEO. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think, I think, it might be a little bit about that. But the other thing is, is that I think the job of the CEO has started to shift gravitationally in terms of being the steward of the share price. Um, and if that's their job, then, you know, you, you really have to break through um, in terms of, of saying, how can we get you focused on doing some things that maybe, maybe seem counterintuitive, seem um, in opposition to the share price um, and seem like it's going to create more costs, um, which Wall Street doesn't like. Um, 
And uh, to, to do that, they have to take risks. It's what you were talking about, that sort of brave moment. And nothing kind of, you know, lights a fire to make you brave um, if you're being attacked. Um, <laughs> you have to either fight or flight. Um, and so um, how are you going to respond in that kind of situation? So I think, I think that's a lot of the, the reasoning behind it throw them in the deep end and see if they swim yeah. um, makes a lot of sense. And, and um, you know, building on the role of the CEO, what existing or new roles are you seeing at the executive table that are really, you know, bearing the responsibility of the ESG initiatives? Is it, I mean, I've seen chief sustainability officers, but are you seeing the, since supply, you know, the supply chain leads kind of stepping into this or what are you seeing? Yeah. So we're starting to see at the C-suite much more of this sort of, chief sustainability officer role, and you, you now are going to see chief ESG officer role, which will be the same thing as the chief sustainability officer, just a new title, maybe some expanded uh, role accountability, but basically the same thing. Starting to see some companies that, um, you know, I'd point to McDonald's, for example, which has created a senior executive for social impact. Um, and so they kind of um, divide a little bit the environmental and the, the social impact side. Um, as well, and starting to see a little bit more of that. The other thing that I'm starting to see is that the ESG function is really tough. Um, it's very popular right now. A lot of people want to go into it, both uh, new graduates as well as even mid-career executives who feel like it's a more purpose-driven role. But the ESG role should be a very, very strategic role. And what happens is it gets sucked into having to do a lot of compliance-related activities, Mm -hmm. um, having to do the environment, social and governance report over and over again every year. And there's a lot of standards and things you have to do for that. And then all kinds of investors and others are putting out these ESG rating surveys. So having to respond to those. And so basically you become this glorified report writer and survey responder. And, uh, um, you know, uh, fine, I'll, I'll acknowledge there's some value in doing that, but it's not, I think, where the need is and where the main game needs to be. So companies are really struggling to figure out how do we get to more of the strategic and operational elements? How do we develop programs? How do we do more of the integration of ESG into our business? And if the ESG team is overwhelmed and can't get to it, we're starting to see some interesting functions, some cross-functional teams coming together of different business leaders um, and operational leaders who are coming together to take that aspect of it on. Um, and whether or not that's formalized will depend on the, on the company, but you're starting to see these almost steering committees come, come to the fore um, in these companies to handle it. Uh, so that's an interesting trend. That compliance pitfall scares me because you could so quickly just become, you know, a checkbox filler, you know, and you're just defining more and more process to define. I mean, this is what, you know, I've seen happen in the um, health insurance world as an example. You know, the people there really want to help improve patient outcomes, but there's been so many mandates from at a state and, and a federal level that they end up just swamped with process upon process that's just meant to, to check boxes. I hope we can avoid that somehow in the SG. Yeah, you know, it, it's such a powerful point. Transparency has been a major strategy of the movement that's been trying to drive ESG and reporting. And I think that one of the things that starts to get lost is that we start to see that transparency in reporting, which is important. I don't want to suggest it isn't, but we start to see it as, as an end and not the means to an end. Mm. Um, and when we start to see it as an end, that's where we get these 21 companies that I was talking about um, that are saying, Look, look how much we can list that we are doing. Look how we are complying with different standards that we're supposed to report on and talk about. You know, we, we have a human rights policy. We have human rights built into our supplier code of conduct. Check two boxes. You know, suddenly my grade on the rating went from a C plus to a solid B um, uh, by doing that. Um, you know, great. I'm, I'm glad they have these policies. They should. Um, but the but the point is not to have a policy and to report it. The point is actually to do something meaningful about improving working conditions across your global supply chain. Um, and and so if we're not doing that, what that means is is that you know I'll mention George really quickly that I think we're going to a real phase transition right now, and we can see it happen. There's a lot of backlash starting to come from 
those um, thought leaders in ESG, those who are advocates for ESG, now writing pieces saying ESG has is, is lost its way. And I think that what they're really saying is, is that we're moving into an era of impact. Um, and the, the phase for companies right now is that it's not about getting an impressive report out that ticks all these boxes, as you were talking about. It's about showing very, very clearly that the world is better off because of what you're doing um, in a variety of dimensions. And if we can't show that, then we're not going to have uh, we're going to have nothing but skepticism and cynicism. We're not going to look authentic. Um, we're going to start seeing more more campaigning ac action. We're going to see um, more efforts at, at strict regulation, um, a, and also the world's going to going to be worse off. Um, a, so, yeah. it's it's really the area of impact is coming. Well, that's why your work is so important because you're showing the cold hard facts that if if you do this with your heart in the right place and you do it all the way, that you're going to have real bottom line impact. And and if you're doing it for that reason rather than just compliance or rather than just pressure, it's kind of kind of hard to argue with the bottom line dollars at the end of the day. And so so that's got me optimistic on it. Um, so Steve, I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, one thing I'd like to end on is um, what's the best advice you've ever received in life or work? Oh, wow. Um, uh, that is um, that is, is is so, so good. I come back to something that comes from one of my um, favorite professors um, who focused, and I think it's related to ESG, but it's related to a lot of things. And that is that think, think probabilistically. Um, don't think about possibilities. Think about what is probable. Um, and that is a really, really key tool to make decisions. There's so much analysis paralysis. Um, uh, there's, there's so much skittishness um, in terms of what's going on in, in these types of fields. There's, there's such limitations on bravery. And when anyone wants to make a decision, there's always um, very, very good arguments that will come from all sides. Um, and I think stepping back and saying, look, we have to identify w what's, what's probable to happen based on different scenarios and, and, and what do we want to have happen. Focus on that um, uh, and we'll be able to cut through the morass and make clear decisions and take action. And so that's something that I really take with me. I love it. It gets people off their butts and doing things. I think it's fantastic. Um, Steve, thanks so much for being here. I really enjoyed it. Uh, loved being here, George. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.